And as a result, if you have an unconventional background and you reach out to a recruiter, you're basically asking them to do something that they... This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is gonna be just a little bit different. For this one, I had my friend Jeremy Harris back on the show. He was previously on, on episode 15 of the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. His company, Sharpest Minds, has collected data on the success rates of its mentees and how they performed in the job application process. The team was gracious enough to share the findings uh, via a blog post, and they've also shared a slide deck with me. I highly recommend watching my most recent YouTube video where I go through the findings before listening in here. In this episode, we talk through some of the questions that I had about their job application findings, and also some actionable things that you can do to improve your chances on the job market. I hope you enjoy. The first question I had was kind of what was the sample size of this data, if you can allude to that? I think that, um, you know, I always want to make sure that this is representative of the population. And if it isn't representative of the population, what are some ways that it wouldn't be? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And it's actually one that we we wrestled with in terms of deciding when to launch this, because we're aware that like when we launched this, it suddenly was thrown in the face, this data was thrown in the face of like all our mentees who are job seeking. And we didn't want them to be operating on data that's like super noisy or not representative. So the sample size we're talking about in terms of mentees is over 200 at this point. I think it's maybe 220-ish as of the time we're, we're talking. Um, but yeah, as of the date we released it, we had data for over 150 mentees. Um, what you're seeing there is the 200. And, uh, and it reflects data across, at this stage, I think it's over uh, 7,000 applications. And these are spread across job boards, LinkedIn, and cold email reach outs. Awesome. And are the mentees, I think, like categorically different from just a random person applying? You know, there's probably more coaching. There's probably more... Um, I like maybe nuance that they have less typos in their resume, <laughs> things like yeah. that. I mean, realistically, would you say that all these rates are like at least very slightly artificially high? Uh, yeah, I, I would say there's, so you're right. Th this data needs to be couched in a strong, your mileage may vary uh, caveat. And it, it goes along a couple of different axes. Like the first one is we screen people in based on a, a questionnaire. So we have a quiz that asks them, what have you built before and where are you at right now? So that's the baseline just for getting in. A lot of these applications actually get thrown out by, um, not thrown out, but put in, let's say, by mentees right when they join to calibrate. We encourage them to do that just so they know like, okay, what are my response rates? Where should I be focusing? Just to kind of get them in that mindset. There's nothing like making contact with the actual market to, to tell you where you need to focus. And um, yeah, and then they do get support from their mentors. They also get support from Sharpest Minds on resume and LinkedIn review. And the last thing that I think really moves the needle on this too, that's worth mentioning is the, the overall purpose of this whole system is to allow us to run scaled A-B tests on job application techniques. So we've been A-B testing a combination of cold email reach out copy, so the templates that people use to reach out. We have five templates that we've settled on. And the same for LinkedIn direct messaging. So we've been iterating on these basically constantly since we launched. And the whole idea is basically to, to optimize response rates and interview rates from those. So what we've seen in that process is not a massive change. So when you don't use templating, typically we see around 20 to 30% lower response rates across the board for these different strategies. So, you know, 20 to 30% boost, it's not going to revolutionize your experience. It does open a lot more opportunities for serendipity and so on, which is why we like to do it. But I think it's fair to say it's all going to be directionally accurate. Um, you know, it helps you decide certainly what strategies you should focus more on and which less. It's just a question of like, you know, relatively speaking, um, you know, how, how are you going to perform compared to like a sharpest minds mentee? And I think that is where you, you do have to do a little introspection, you know, get somebody else to help you with your, your template writing, if you're maybe ESL or, or that sort of thing. Awesome. And, you know, I guess to that point, the, the AB testing, it helps with the individual reach out 20, 30% by channel. But I think this shows that even without that, going through LinkedIn messaging or cold emails, those channels are just so much more effective. That That is still the case, I see. Absolutely. And I think like one of the big philosophies for this was we wanted to come up with information that would generalize beyond the sharpest minds population. Like it's not particularly useful to the universe of data scientists to just be like, hey, if you follow this like highly specific uh, trademark patented thing, then, you know, we really wanted to, to make more general statements. And as much as we could, while still 
you know, respecting our ethical responsibility to our mentees to optimize their process. That's what we're, we're reporting here. Awesome. And um, so obviously all of your mentees are in US and Canada, if I remember that correctly. Do you think that this could be extrapolated to markets outside of that? Do you think there are any things that are tried and true enough that work beyond the cultural barriers or whatever that might be? Or is this still pretty specific to US Canada? So this is a really good question. I think there are some areas that it would generalize to. Uh, we've seen other, um, from, from sort of mentee experience and mentor experience, one of the reasons that, for example, we haven't expanded to India is that there are significant cultural differences in terms of how people deal with authority. So you can't just reach out as easily to like a hiring manager and deal with them like, you know, hey, buddy, I'd love to set up a call type thing, which is more like you're not quite all the way over there uh, in North America, but you're more in that direction. Um, so, so a lot of the copy does change. Some of the reach out strategies change. I, I will mention actually just one thing that's a detail worth noting, especially when you look at the LinkedIn and cold email strategies. One thing that uh, I'd recommend just about anyone do if you're in North America or Europe, reach out not to recruiters, but to hiring managers. The, the whole flow that we highlight and, and the numbers we report here are for those reach outs. If you reach out to recruiters, your response rates will plummet. We have seen that. It's really not a place you want to be. So um, as much as possible, yeah, those LinkedIn and cold email reach outs have to be targeted, uh, at least in North America. But to your point, not too sure how that generalizes to like Asia, for example. No, I mean, honestly, that's really good to know. I, you know, I, I historically have lumped hiring managers and recruiters in the same bucket. Um, and I, I'm really happy to know that there's like a differentiation there. Um, and you know, those people are not that hard to find. LinkedIn is a, a very powerful tool. Yeah, actually. So to that point, I, I don't know if it'd be useful for me to elaborate a little bit on like the sure. distinction. Okay. Um, so when it comes to, for, first off, we can talk about the roles. Like what is a recruiter? What is a hiring manager? Cause I think a lot of, especially new job seekers have a bit of a question mark there. So recruiters are people who are generally non-technical. So they, they know the names of libraries. They know the names of programming languages, but they don't generally know how to use them. They're not coders. They're not data scientists. And as a result, um, quite often what we see from recruiters is risk aversion. So they don't know how to assess technical skills on the merits because you know if, if they did, they'd be data scientists. Uh, so they're forced to look for proxies. They're, they look for proxies like education, past experience, that sort of thing. They're not even that capable of looking at projects and figuring out, okay, is this a hard project or an easy project? Uh, the best recruiters at places like Google and so on probably can. But what we've tended to see is there is that kind of missing technical literacy. And as a result, if you have an unconventional background and you reach out to a recruiter, you're basically asking them to do something that they kind of aren't super capable of doing. Um, they, they don't have the skills to look at somebody with a, a weird background, a non, not a non-technical background, but like a non-specialized background. You haven't gone to do a, a you know, Harvard uh, master's in data science or something like that. Uh, you've just built a bunch of projects. That, that's what you have to show for you. That's like, that is your portfolio and how you appear. That's what you want to sell yourself on. They can assess you on that. So the people who can are technical people. And the people who are incentivized to do that well are generally hiring managers. So these are people who are willing, if you approach them the right way, to look at your Jupyter notebook or your code. But you don't want to lead with that. You don't want to like, you know, like on a first date, tell somebody to marry you. You don't want to reach out to a recruiter, sorry, a hiring manager and say, hey, I'd love for you to review 300 lines of my code. Um, that's not like first date material. What you want to do is reach out to them and say, hey, I built a toy. So here's a deployed app. It's fun to play with. Play around with it. And if you're interested, here's a link to the GitHub. And if they, if they see something useful, if, if they see that you're able to build cool stuff, that really is like the best way to a uh, hiring manager's heart. So that process is what we recommend people follow. They build a project usually on Sharpest Minds. And then our whole process is about how do you market that project? How do you put it in front of somebody through these emails and these reach outs? Awesome. I, I love that. And you know, something kind of um, made a lot of sense to me when you were talking about that. And it's matching your message to the channel. You know, for example, I have a YouTube channel where I make a certain type of videos. I have a podcast channel where I make another completely different type of video. And um, when you're looking at the interview process, if someone's newer to the field, and just like you said, they have the portfolio, but not necessarily like a, a rich education history, the right channel is the hiring manager. If you're coming out of another data science role and you have quite a bit of experience and you look really great on paper as a data scientist, going to a recruiter is going to work plenty well because that's what they're exactly what they're looking for. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's something that 
um, my friend Jeff Lee, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, he he did really well. So he he tracked all of his data, and I might do a a, a reaction to to his article that he wrote. But he tracked all of his data uh, when he applied the first time as an entry level data scientist. When he applied a second time, well, actually in this like over the pandemic where he's had two three years of experience, and the response rates are unbelievably different just based on his past experience. So it, it's kind of cool to see, you know, you match the message to the channel. That's like, that's kind of the thing, right? I mean, that's, that's what's important. Yeah. And it, it's so, it's so easy to like, when you're, when you're looking for a data science job or analytics job early on, and you're like, you've never had one before your new job seeker. It's very understandable to like not do that. Cause you don't have a clue what these different roles are. So like, I remember when I was getting started and I didn't even understand like, what is a recruiter? What is a hiring manager? Is a hiring manager like a role? And it turns out it's not like you generally won't go on LinkedIn and find, you know, hiring manager. It's a responsibility. And so like, how do I identify hiring managers? And like, that's a whole set of questions. Another can of worms. That's right. Yeah. And, and so the, that's the thing is matching the channel is like, you have to know that the channels exist, which is its own challenge. And then you have to kind of put yourself in the shoes too of that person you're reaching out to. And then that's a tough thing. If you, if, you don't, if you don't have a good mental model of what's going on in a company because you haven't worked in one yet, it's difficult to go like, oh, okay, I'm a hiring manager. This is what's keeping me up at night. These are the metrics I have to move. This is what I have to do in order to get promoted or get recognized and so on. So once you figure that out, once you, you really kind of nail down how you can make the hiring manager's life better, all of a sudden your response rates start to go up. And that's really the philosophy that animates a lot of this, uh, this strategy. Awesome. I mean, that, that to me, uh, I think is uh, like almost like a paradigm shift where you're looking at it one way and then you're like, oh, I, I've just been looking at it differently. It's, it's uh, uh, I think that hopefully for a lot of people watching this, that'll be very empowering. Uh, then the next thing I wanted to ask is, could these metrics these strategies also apply to data analyst roles, data engineering roles. And then maybe on a follow-up to that, how do you see the, the data engineering role or some of these other roles growing in the space um, in popularity or, or in uh, like role definition? Great. Well, actually, it's a testament to how in touch you are too with, with like the needs of, uh, of people in this space who are trying to break in that this is the exact question that we got the minute we launched the dashboard. First thing we got asked was like, so how, like I, I'm, um, you know, I'm a data analyst or I'm a data engineer. I'm, I want to become an ML engineer. Does this apply to me? And so the short answer is when we measure across, first thing I need to flag here is there's a very big um, class imbalance on Sharpest Minds between how many people are uh, becoming MLEs, how many are becoming data engineers, how many are becoming analysts, and so on. So you got very different balances of people targeting these things, which means the sample size isn't that huge in particular for, um, sorry, actually, I pulled it up here. Yeah, so, so for machine learning researchers, that's by far our rarest category. We're looking at about 3 to 4% of our user base doing that. And um, after that, it's like, yeah, 15% data engineers, 20% ML engineers, um, 30%-ish data analysts, and about the same data scientists. So, you know, there's quite a bit of variability. With that caveat, it does seem as if these strategies do work pretty well across the board. Our sample size with machine learning researchers, like, I would not trust me um, to, to say that, like, because we have like eight or eight or nine people who are in that camp who we actually have data for on, on this stuff. So like, you know, your mileage may vary. That's eight or nine data points, but directionally, everything does seem to track together in that way. Yeah. I mean, I would also say with the machine learning researchers, the pipeline for that is generally very, very different in terms of like going through academia and those types of things. So I, I, I it's really good to know that this is also I think anecdotally, uh, anecdotally applicable for those roles, because to me, I, I don't look at them as any different than a data science role. They're just different disciplines, different set of skills within the, in the, within the field. There might be some slight pay differences, but uh, you know, I know plenty of people that love their data analyst job. They don't want to do data science, which I, which I also think is, is pretty fun and fascinating. Um, my next thought is, you know, how is the pandemic uh, impacted all of this. Have you seen any difference in rates during this time period? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is actually, I'm smiling because this is like the origin story of this dashboard was um, back in, so we started in January. We're like, hey, we should probably help people just like log their job applications. That was the idea. And 
and, and all of a sudden, we, so we noticed a massive crash in the number of, um, uh, of job offers that we were seeing on the platform. So Sharpest Minds is income share based. So the idea is we make money when somebody gets hired. Um, so we're like, that's one of our key metrics. Like one of the few things that we actually see every day is like how many people are getting hired this month or this week. And so we see that metric crash with COVID. And we find ourselves all of a sudden fielding like a lot of questions from mentees about, you know, like, should I even be applying in this, in this market, in this environment? Like, should I just wait? Should I upskill? Should I do a master's and all that? And as fast as things crashed, I should, I should pull up our data, but it was basically like the lowest month by far in our history was actually not our full history, but since, you know, for, for, for the 18 months prior was April, 2020. So we got, we actually got two people hired all month. And our, our normal is to see something more like 15. So we see like now at least 15 hires a month. So when you see crash at two, you're like, oh damn, that's, that's quite bad. And um, so essentially at that stage, we're like, okay, we need to, we need to do something about this. Uh, we need to communicate to people that this is not a, like if you're thinking of building your project, extending your project, uh, working on the way you market yourself to companies by you know, writing better email templates or whatever, stuff that's like almost job search infrastructure, now is a good time to do that. Um, now is a good time to, you know, not uh, flood the market with more applications. And very, quite quickly, it turned around. We saw our numbers recover back up. And I think within, it was probably about three or four months, we started to see basically, you know, 10, 10 hires a month, then, uh, then 12 and then 15. And really, it started to grow. And it was at that moment really where we said, okay, we need a way to get this data in front of mentees. We need a way to give them like a live feed, essentially, like a Bloomberg terminal for the job market, which is what this became. Um, but the short answer is the pandemic had this like sort of flash effect that was quite short. It came from the fact that companies just didn't know. They, 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 there was so much uncertainty. It wasn't that cash flow dried up all of a sudden for in some industries it had, but for many companies, it was just like, we don't know where this could go. We could be seeing a complete crash in the broader stock market. Turned out the Fed decided to like print a bunch of money and, and guarantee stock levels and so on. But uh, at the end of the day, this was, this was the, the flash that really crippled a lot of people's confidence. And when you send out those applications and you're not getting any responses, when you see like a 80, 90% drop in, um, in job offer rates in a month, um, you know, keep in mind, there could be noise in there too. When we talk about a sample size of 15 a month, that, you know, plus or minus whatever, five or so, but still that's a huge crash. Like that can affect your confidence. And that was one of the first things we realized, like, okay, we got mentees who are doubting themselves rather than looking at the broader job market and saying, well, wait a minute, am I maybe just fitting into a broader story here? And the thing that needs to change is my approach to the job hunt, what I'm focusing on right now, rather than like, I need to, I don't know, do another Kaggle competition. I, like I, I must not have skills where they need to be. And just to, to kind of make one last related point on this, um, one of the things we start to see anytime this happens, when, when response rates go really, really low, it has this weird psychological effect on people where self-blame starts to happen. So you start to, to say, okay, there must be something wrong with me because I'm not getting good response rates, right? We know 2% for in the median case for um, job board applications. You, that feels really terrible. The way that feels is you imagine today sending out 50 applications and hearing back from one but from one probabilistically. So sometimes you don't even hear back at all. Sometimes you hear back from two, but like that is very, very psychologically difficult. And it causes an like an irrational response too, which is like, we've seen this happen a lot where people will go, oh man, I need to work on my SQL skills. I need to work on my project. The problem is that like you're sending your resume out with these job applications in a cover letter. And you're not often mentioning a lot of the things that you're going to go back and work on. So one of the things that we've been focusing on is like getting people's eyes on the right stage of the funnel. If you're having trouble generating interviews, like just getting to the interview stage, then don't work on your interview performance. Like that's not the source of the problem. Think about how you present yourself to companies. What's the first thing they're going to see? Are they going to see your resume? Are they going to see your personal website? Are they going to see your references? Are they going to see your project? If you're not including your project in your applications, there's no point to iterating on it in order to improve your conversion rates, uh, unless you have a specific strategy you want to test out that in includes a project. So there was a clarifying value we found to just telling people like, yeah, this is what's going on in the market. If you're at this rate, like, that's cool. Like, don't blame yourself. This is just what the market is. Maybe ask yourself what other strategies you might try. Because 
the, you know, as Peter Thiel says, competition is for losers. You just don't want to be competing at that level, but um, certainly don't blame yourself. Don't fall into those spirals of, of self-doubt. Yeah. And, you know, something that I find really powerful to cut through that doubt is just treating this process like a data scientist would. I mean, that's, that's what you guys are doing is that, like when you quantify something, you take this self-doubt issue away. I mean, you, you can start doubting yourself if you're getting it like a 0.01% interview rate clip, right? That would be, that would be an issue. But I sincerely doubt that anyone who has been carefully measuring their process um, to be able to get a reasonable conversion rate, like if you're thinking in that way, you're probably not going to be one of those people that gets an interview every a thousand applications you send out. So there's this kind of, uh, you know, it, it, whenever you quantify something, at least in this case, there is that, you know, like psychological counseling effect to, yeah. to, uh, to helping uh, encourage you, especially if there's a benchmark like this. Absolutely. And, and it, it has this, um, this way of drawing your attention to the things you have agency over. It, like a way of reclaiming that agency when, when you just like, if you close your eyes and send out 50 applications on like indeed or uh, LinkedIn easy apply or whatever, you're kind of like, there's, there's a way in which you exert yourself, you're exhausted. And then all you are waiting for is the pain of not hearing back. But the moment you start to think of it as a funnel, like you said, like a data scientist, you got your first step. What's my conversion rate on this? What's my conversion rate to the second interview? What's my conversion rate to the on-site and so on? All of a sudden, it kind of like focuses your attention on, well, wait a minute, like the problem with my process is clearly here. And the moment that you have a well-defined problem to address, that gives you agency. You're like, okay, what can I do to fix this is the next obvious question. And you don't get into like, this kind of, um, you know, flip the table and throw your hands up in the air and say, this is all messed up. I'm never going to make it type thing. It's, it is very psychologically centering. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, as a side part of what I like about the work that we do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, what, one, I have two more questions. The first is that, you know, what do you think the future of this market looks like? We've done a lot of, I guess, descriptive understanding statistics. Well, actually you have, I've done literally nothing. I'm just reading it, but, um, you know, where do, are there any trends that suggest where this might go? What might become more important? Um, are, are, you know, are there things that you see changing in this space or how people are applying? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's something that like we spend probably a disproportionate amount of time worrying about because we have these approaches that are pretty tailored to specific job categories. And, you know, I mean, like you want to make sure that you're aware and catching these things as, as they shift. So I think one example of a recent shift that we've seen, uh, let's say in the last two years, is this focus on the software engineering skills associated with becoming a data scientist. So the expectation is no longer like you run a Jupyter notebook locally and then you drive interesting insights and, and then you make pretty plots and then a bunch of question marks and three dots and, and then no one quite knows what happens. Companies are now saying, look, we, we, like we've invested a lot in this process in developing teams and so on. We want product, we want an actual deliverable that's driving value. And whether that's in the form of analytics dashboards that the entire company or entire teams can access, not just data scientists, or whether that's in the form of like production systems that end up getting served up to users like recommender systems and so on, the, the rubber is starting to have to meet the road. And that means data scientists have to learn some kind of deployment uh, tools and what those tools are, are also shifting. So what we saw two years ago was this universe where all of a sudden people are like, what can you deploy? What can you build? So you had things like AWS and Heroku uh, as sort of infrastructure. And then you had maybe like Flask or Django. So the, these very kind of um, Pythonic, um, heavy duty web development frameworks, which were not horrible to learn, but kind of a bit of a pain. Um, it's still good if you can master those. But there's a sense in which we're seeing, seeing a shift towards more easy to use frameworks like Streamlit, for example. Um, Love Streamlit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan too. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's have the thing, you, right? You, oh, sorry. Uh, unrelated. Have you interviewed um, Adrian yet for I PDS? Have. Okay. Yeah, I have. Well, just making sure. Yeah, I, great. Uh, that's it. He was one of my favorite interviews. Like, unbelievably cool guy. I'll have yeah. to go check out the episode. I'll have to check out yours. I had no idea you'd done that too. I, I love his energy. Yeah. I, just awesome guy all around. Sorry, so tangential going back to- Yeah, no, 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 not at all. I mean, but that's it. Yes, Streamlit really, like it's one of those, pro I hate to sound like I'm 
product placing here, but like it really is something that people should check out. There are frameworks like it as well um, that, you know, like related frameworks. They're all, a lot of this is, is open source too. And that's really, that's the thing you want to embrace. Like we're free tooling. You don't want to get, you know, pinned down and have like vendor lock in or something uh, and be spending money during your job search too, which is bad. There are a lot of great open source frameworks. And the more you can be able to like, to get your data, your results, your insights in some easily communicable form to people, like I mentioned hiring managers, I mean, that really is the, the goal, the better, you, the better off you'll be, really, the, the more of an impact you'll make. You want to avoid that first date impact where you're like, you know, hey, read a bunch of my code, send them a toy. Uh, that toy also proves that you have that coveted skill of building cool stuff, actually building stuff. Um, so I, I would say that's probably the single biggest shift. There's another um, there's another shift that's happened too, as we've seen more and more, not quite auto ML, but as tooling has improved around data science to make data scientists more efficient, the expectation that data scientists are going to get more involved in the business end of the process is starting to increase as well. So a great way to differentiate yourself really is starting to be, you know, how well can you understand the business? How well can you think strategically? And, um, and so on. So it's sort of two families of things, I guess the software engineering and then the business side. And you know, there's a lot more horizontal movement, I think, than people might realize as well. Like, sorry, do you have- No, I mean, that, that, that's kind of funny to me because when I was like looking to break into the field, you I mean, realistically, that's kind of how I viewed it. I was like, look, I, I have really strong business, a uh, really strong business background, right? I, I was doing management consulting. I have a, a graduate degree in business. The hardest thing for me in my mind is going to be the computer science and like the coding. How do I prove to employers or other people that I'm really strong in that? I do a master's in computer science. I go like completely the other direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could have very easily done like one of the master's in data science programs, but you know, I already had the business logic. I already yeah. knew some of those skills. I thought it was redundant to pursue that because if I could just like, you know, go to two extremes and bring those together. I mean, I, I figured hopefully that's what the, <laughs> the market would be looking for in the next couple of years or, or that would, you know, qualm any doubts that they had about either of those skills for me. So it's like, well, um, that, that definitely resonates with me. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's kind of funny how like the, the business, the value of the business center creeps up on people. Like there's, um, so I think we talked about this in the, in the conversation we did earlier, but you know, as a physicist, I did always approach startups in particular, just like kind of the world through a technical lens that implicitly and sometimes explicitly devalued anything that wasn't technical. So I would like, I'd look at non-technical people and be like, oh my God, just like, you know, like l learn to code, but like even more so like, you know, learn some physics, man, like, you know, business, whatever, it's not really valuable. And then you get into these environments and you realize yeah, they're, they're actual, like they're major competencies that are involved in the business side of things. And it's, it's, I, I hate to use soft skills as a terminology, but it's correct. Like it really is. You want to get better at empathizing with people, um, understanding problems more deeply, like why are people actually using the product that the company you're applying to is, is selling. And like, without understanding that you can't get a whole picture of like the data problem that you're addressing either, but it also prevents you from, from taking on management roles. It prevents you from growing out of your role and into something else. So yeah, very easy, I think, for technical people to fall into this trap, just like I did. Um, my, my first recommendation would be like, think about if you were to start that company today from the ground up, like what would you need to know to do that and not make an idiot out of yourself? And it, as you, as you kind of ruminate on that, you're probably going to think of a couple things that will surprise you. Like, you got to pick up the phone and start calling people. You got to start asking them about their problems so you even know what to solve. Um, a lot of these are non-obvious and those are those those soft skills. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I've been thinking about this a reasonable amount lately. I find the technical skills are usually, I guess as a business term, what we talk about is a strategic minimum. Like you have to be able to code at a certain level. But yeah. the business skills, well, the quote unquote software skills, they work on a spectrum, Right. And you can see, I mean, like you can tell a difference immediately when you're talking to someone or when they're explaining an idea to you. With the technical skills, we use an assessment, right? Like a lot of people will probably perform roughly the same on an assessment. I mean, a project is a little different. It tells a bit, of, a bit more of a story, but at the same time, isn't a project like conveying business skill, 
right? Like right. a really great project versus an average project is great yeah. because like of the problem they're solving or of the story they're telling the analysis, like the marginal, the marginal improvement of the analysis from a good to a great project, like is going to be less impactful than the story and the other, like the accoutrement you, uh, you tie to it. So, uh, you know, I think with the business side and the soft skills, the upside is tremendously higher mm -hmm. than like having a slightly better technical ability, which I don't think people realize. It's it's very clear how you improve your technical skills, those, and it's not very clear how you improve the business stuff. Yes, and a hundred like I feel like this is one of the big things that that people do miss. It's it's the access you want to differentiate yourself along as much as possible. So like one of the most common mistakes that, um, that I'll see from new mentee applicants who are applying to jobs is like, they'll do a little research on the company, but like if they get an interview, but they, but they won't dive into it. They won't try to take ownership. They, they won't try to like pretend that they actually own this business. What would you do? Like if you were Netflix today, what gets you excited? Like what kind of initiative gets you excited? Like never mind that you're not a world class like Fortune 100 CEO or whatever. That's totally cool. It's understood. You know, you're applying to this job. It's an entry level thing. That's totally cool. But show that you have an interest in the strategic side. Show that you have an interest in like identifying features and maybe like weird user experience uh, patterns that they have on the website. Like, hey, you know, I, I tried to find movies that were similar to this, but I, I couldn't quite use the interface to do what I wanted to do. What do you think the odds are that other users have that problem? By the way, I built like a recommender system that does something similar. My, like sh things that show initiative and that curiosity that over time and with training and exposure becomes business acumen. That that nucleus is what you have to prove you have. And you don't have to be an all-star, but you have to show that you're interested in that skill set. And then immediately you set yourself apart from everybody who thinks life is a Kaggle competition and is showing up there and being like, you know, okay, I can code up a storm, but I, I don't really care about this business. Uh, no, I. that's something that like, I, I can't stress enough. I mean, in my course, that's something I talk about extensively is that you know, you're, I read this a while ago, I can't remember where, which is a little disappointing, but the one of the largest indicators of startup success is passion for the project or the, or the product or whatever it is, right? Um, and I think a lot of hiring managers know that if someone is like really enthusiastic about what they're doing, they're going to be, they're at least going to work and try and learn the skills or do whatever it is. And every job you're applying to like you have to figure, find a way to love the product. You have to find a way to, to like create this story where it matches, um, matches who you are, matches your philosophy. I remember I probably have like astronomically high conversion rates when I read a cover letter because I love the cover letter writing process. I love talking about how, like, I remember I applied to, there was a like way out punning my coverage. There's a role for like a, VP of data science at, at one of the ski mountains that I grew up going to. And my cover letter was talking about my first experience skiing there, like, like a bunch of stuff not related to data yeah. science, but it's talking about like, wow, I like, I've used your product. I love what it is. And I'd love to like help expand it. I mean, like, if you apply to Netflix, and you weren't <laughs> you, you didn't watch Netflix, <laughs> right? <is> on time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you shouldn't apply there. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, maybe you'll become a user, but that's a pretty bad acquisition strategy for users for them. If <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. I mean, uh, and I think Air, so. Airbnb is legendary for this too, right? They they have um, at least in the early days, they insisted that literally every employee be an Airbnb get, uh, maybe even host, but at least guest. And that was in a world where like Airbnb was really small community. So like this was selecting for people deeply passionate, like the early adopters of this product, companies deeply care about that. And it's like, this is back to that theme of like, try to empathize a little bit with that hiring manager. Like think about what keeps them up at night. Think about what validates them as a human being. If you're in the room and they're like, you know, like you said, if it's Netflix and this hiring manager is, is a human primate, like all of us, they like the idea of thinking that they're involved in something with purpose that other people would find valuable. And if they ask you like, you know, what do you, what do you think of the product? Or, or if, if you let slip that like, yeah, I, I don't really give a shit. I like, I haven't used Netflix. I prefer Amazon. Pro like, like that, that is not validating for them. Like you can understand if you were them being like, well, who's this jerk? Like, wh like what?
think we're back. Oh, I'm back. Sorry about that. My internet is uh, has been acting up a little bit. Jeez, again. All right, we're back, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I've been having some internet issues lately. It's driving me nuts. Uh, but we were good. Is that good then, Hawaiian so internet? Yeah, I, honestly, I've been using, we have Spectrum, and it is just like the worst experience of all time. Um, especially, you know, oh, really? I guess technically I run an online business. And like the modem died on... Um, on Monday, I teach, I'm teaching this university course on Tuesdays. It's four hours and they couldn't get someone oh in to repair it until today. And, uh, I was just like, look, like I went and I went to like four different spectrum stores and just exchanged the modem. So I at least was smart enough to diagnose that it was the modem. It wasn't like, like our cable was working. I just put the wires in, but you know, I mean, it, the turnaround time is awful when everyone has to work online these days. Like, uh, but I digress. <laughs> That's a day of work. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one thing I just wanted to add to to, to that is that, um, like these companies, uh, first just use the products, and second, the companies can tell if you use the products, right? And you should probably apply to companies. Yeah. Look at the products you use and you love, and apply to those companies. They probably need data scientists. Yes. Um, I I, I uh, a long time ago when I was in right before I started grad school the first time, I was a huge consumer. I used, uh, played DraftKings all the time. I loved it. And okay. I was like, hey, well, you know, I love what they, I love this product. I have time for an internship before I start grad school. Like, let's look online and see if they, if they have a spot or if they have something open. And they had like an undergrad internship yep. and I applied, but in my cover letter, I like, I gave them my account. I said, look, I use your product a lot. I want to like help. Nice. Um, and uh, they made a new position for me, like a grad student internship, which didn't exist before, right? Like, like if you show loyalty, like even with human interaction, if you show loyalty to someone, like that gets rewarded in, in some way, right? I mean, what company wouldn't want like uh, one of the zealots for their product, product to, to work for them, right? I mean, it's just... Well, and, and again, that's, yeah, that's like, that, that's that empathy point again, right? It's like when you're, um, so I, I forget where I saw this. There was a report that talked about the average tenure of engineers at, at you know, top companies like, like Google, you know, Fang type companies. And it's like two to three years. And, you know, th that doesn't sound like a big deal unless you put yourself in the shoes of the hiring manager. You train someone up that probably takes about a year. You're getting valuable work out of them for one to two years and then they jump ship. And you've got to retrain another person all over again. You got to go through a, a hiring process that costs tens of, th tens of thousands of dollars. You want to get back to coding, or you want to get back to management, or you want to get back to whatever the thing is that you're passionate about. And here you are being dragged into this process. So if you have somebody who shows up and says, like, "Yeah, I'm, I love DraftKings. You're like, check out my account. I've been using it for two years. I, I'm on it like twice a week. Um, you know, here's some of the things that I think you could improve. Here's, here's what you're, you're doing really well. Uh, anyway, that, that's her thing. You're right. Like, there's there's so much more flexibility, I think, in the world than a lot of people realize in terms of creating new positions too. It's, um, I, th I think it's easy to fall into that if you think of the hiring process as adversarial and you're like, okay, it's like a, a high school test or a university test and that, and that hiring manager is trying to find ways to say no, but they're actually trying to find ways to say yes. And if you come to them and you're an interesting enough person, the odds that they're going to be like, hmm, I wonder if we can carve out something for this individual, they're actually surprisingly high but it, it comes with passion and, and, uh, and, and yeah, passion first, I guess. Absolutely. And so my last real question is just like, I mean, you stress on differentiating yourself, right? What are some unique ways you've seen people differentiate themselves uh, that might uh, not be so obvious? Yeah, this is a great question. And it's, there, there are a lot of different examples of this. I think one of the key things to realize is the impression you make on a company, which is the thing that you're using to differentiate yourself, 
depends as much on who you are as how you uh, uh, how you present yourself to the company, how, like the way in which you make contact with them. So the, the reason I think that's relevant, especially in the context of this data, is if you apply through a job board, you immediately put yourself in a bucket that looks something like the median applicant bucket. Everybody's using easy, LinkedIn Easy Apply. Everybody's using AngelList, blah, 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 blah. And so just by putting yourself in that position, you are already fighting a losing battle on the differentiation side. Uh, statistically speaking, if a company is getting 150 applications, you are going to be application number 75 that a hiring manager or recruiter is reviewing during the course of like a three hour morning from hell when they're having to plow through all these applications. Like, like you don't want somebody to be in that brain space when they first see your name on a page where they're just like, oh, Kenji, okay, what, what, you know, what the hell's going on here? Oh, another scikit-learn, pandas, matplotlib, seaboard. Like, like that's not where you want to be. You're, you're all of a sudden like in a really bad spot. So very first thing is think about how you present yourself. What, what is that impression that you're going to make? That doesn't necessarily mean just linked, uh, LinkedIn DMs and cold emails of the kind that we've described. It means how do you make a personal connection with someone? That, that, that's the best differentiating axis. That can include going to online conferences. In fact, we recently did a, a webinar for our, uh, like an internal webinar for our mentees where, so we do these once or twice a month with mentees who were recently hired to tell their story. And this was a mentee called Sifu and, and she's really interesting in terms of what she's like, what she gives herself permission to do. Um, to put herself out there. So what, she, what her whole game plan was, was I'm going to find conferences and I'm going to track down specific people who seem to keep showing up at the same conferences. And I'm going to do a circuit. I'm going to follow them along and I'm going to look for opportunities to engage them. And the, the, the whole goal here is to see people multiple times, to make yourself familiar to people, have your face out there and, and just let, let the sound of your voice become something that isn't new to them. And then all of a sudden you have a brand. I mean, as, and, and it, you know, it's not that there are no stupid questions in that context that you can't embarrass yourself or whatever, but the bar for embarrassing yourself is quite high. I mean, you can get away with a lot if, if you're earnest, if you're sincere, if you're passionate, and you just go out there, ask the questions you want to ask, put yourself out there. The, really, like this is a high leverage way to go, and we've seen it play so well for her. Um, so I would say just, just that approach of differentiation, the way you first make an impression on a company, that, that's a really important piece. Um, the other one is, is the more technical one, and that is a red flag anytime you find yourself um, you know, building a, a, another Jupyter Notebook with Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Seaborn, et cetera, that isn't a product where, where you're not really learning anything new. Maybe you're learning like to use a new algorithm. Like you used KNNs before, you're going to use logistic regression now. Like that's probably not enough of a push. You want to show a bigger delta from project to project. You want to show that you're growing. And that growth is a big part of what, what your brand is going to become and the story that you're going to tell about your journey. Like first I built this, that was fun. Then I was like, hmm, you know what? It'd be really cool to like make this deployable. So I did that. You want to get across the fact that you're a hacker, you get your hands dirty. And again, I'll use this phrase of giving yourself permission to do these things. I think there, there's a lot of like um, inside the box thinking that people get locked into. I find this especially with people who've done a lot of courses. You know, if you're trained by university and high school to like, Think of some, some uh, abstract concept of like a data science curriculum. I have to learn these things and then I will be a capital D, capital S data scientist. And in reality, that doesn't exist. It's a, a weird eclectic mix of skills. The more eclectic, the weirder, the better you are in terms of differentiation. You have to make sure a couple of key pillars or key boxes are ticked. But, um, but really like deployment, um, build a project that involves a passion of yours. So, you know, if you're into sports analytics, like make a project about sports analytics, because then you're able to tell a much better story when you, uh, when you come to, when it comes time to present it to hiring managers. So, you know, build very specific projects that involve deployment. That's one easy access to differentiate yourself on. And then the other is like, how do you first make that impression? Don't like, look at how everybody else is making that impression and do something that is not that. Like it, it really is that easy. Sometimes for introverts, especially, you have to overcome a bit of a barrier. That can be tough, but it really is what's involved in making a unique impression and seeing those conversion rates go up. I, I love so many things about that. I mean, kind of starting at the end, uh, the, the idea that um, every project should have a stakeholder is something that I think is really important. If you're doing the Titanic data set, right? Who's the stakeholder? Yeah, I, I mean, 
that's that, yeah, it's, it's not a, a business problem anymore. Like on the other hand, if you take the Titanic data set and, you know, for example, I made a teaching tutorial about it, like this is how you learn data science from that. Then you clearly have stakeholders, you know, you have hundreds or thousands of whoever people that are going there to learn that can be used as a portfolio. I mean, it's still not yeah. like the best, not something I would lead with, but it's something that is like, it does create positive benefit. You have a notebook out there that other people are creating, getting value and generating from. It shows that hopefully, you know, I can teach some technical things. I have an yeah. understanding of them enough to do that. Um, you know, going back even a step further, one thing that, that I love and I don't see enough of is contributing to open source communities. Right. Um, you know, that is a great way to differentiate yourself and to show some really cool skills is that one, you like, you're comfortable with GitHub too. Yeah. You know how to uh, interact with these communities and that you you are like a team player. There's no better team players than people contributing to open yeah, source. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, then going all the way back to uh, your mentee's story of kind of following that speaker along, you can do that on other mediums, right? LinkedIn is the perfect place to do that. If you're commenting on every one of your, your uh, you know, a perspective, whoever it is, posts. Yeah, like most people aren't like me. They don't have hundreds of people always. Com- well, I don't. That really happens. But uh, like multiple people commenting, you might be one of the few people that are, or fewer people that's commenting on their stuff, and you're going to be able to get more of a one-on-one audience on these platforms. So, I, what you are saying, I am seeing in real life, and I'm also seeing hopefully not just one dimensionally. Not that you're seeing it one dimensionally, but like there's shades and there's like, you can apply the same idea in a bunch of different ways. So I would hope that anyone watching this, like can take that away that like, you know, just because Ken and Jeremy said this one thing, I can take the same idea of it and apply it in this different space. And, and I think it's it's really important to flag, like we're constantly learning about new ways to do this from our mentees and from conversations like this. I'll be the first to admit, I never even thought as like, as obvious in retrospect as it seems, which is the case with all great ideas. I never thought of like telling mentees, hey, you know, maybe like find a couple people you want to just follow on LinkedIn, even if they don't accept your connection request, just follow them and then comment on their stuff in a tasteful way. Um, that's, yeah, that, that's a, a great example of something that like, you know, you need to give yourself permission to do it. There's a bit of that like social barrier before you do it, but that, that barrier is the expression of the advantage that you're gaining. Everybody else has to cross that barrier as well. If you give yourself permission to be the person who does it, all of a sudden you're getting one-on-one time with the hiring manager, whoever it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you right now, there's some people that comment on every single one of my YouTube videos and it's constructive stuff, right? Yeah. And if that person like sends me an email or if those people send me an email, which they have, I am like almost 100% going to respond to it and give it thought. Even if I deem it to be a question that I've answered in a video or done something like that, because they they've like built up the goodwill. Right. Yep. I mean, that's something that is undeniable uh, to me is that like, Hey, well, I would hope it's kind of a human thing that it's like, Hey, if, if you've looked out for me, if you've really like, you know, we've had conversations, I've seen you enough. It would be really rude for me not to. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. It, it, this actually, this reminds me of something that I think there was like a Paul Graham essay where he's talking about startups that a, apply to, to Y Combinator, the sort of startup accelerator that, that he founded. And um, obviously like, so, so YC is, you know, people talk about it as like the Harvard of startup accelerators. It d- doesn't matter, but the bottom line is people try to get in pretty hard and it's got about a 1% acceptance rate. And um, Paul Graham wrote an essay where he says, look, a lot of people talk about YC as if they have a 1% shot of getting in, but that's not true. Most people have either a 100% chance or a 0% chance of getting in. And what determines that are things that are completely under their control. And so in this case, like, you know, when you're saying, hey, you know, I'll respond with almost 100% probability to somebody who makes that effort. Again, that's something fully under your control. If you want to ratchet up those response rates, yeah, think about the way that you're reaching out. Maybe don't think so much about like, um, you know, the, the constellation of things outside of your control, but try to narrow down the few things you actually have agency over and, and start doing some relationship building. 